Okay, looks like we're ready to go. Computer recording started. Recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Good afternoon, and welcome to the remote hearing on the Committee on Technology. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones, electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Holden, we are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Council Member Robert Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology, and I want to welcome everyone to our hearing today. New York City Everyone knows this, never sit still. We are constantly evolving and changing. And when we're at our best, New Yorkers are leading the way. So emerging technologies allow the city to operate more efficiently and provide the most vulnerable New Yorkers access to resources that they need. Technology also can assist the public in holding the government accountable. Today, we're meeting to understand how technology is being leveraged in our city agencies and how emerging technologies will be incorporated into the everyday lives of New Yorkers. To increase the transparency, accountability, and capability of our government and technology, the following bills will be considered. Intro 1133, sponsored by Council Member Rosenthal, will require the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications to do it to create a public online searchable database through which all agencies must report on violations returnable to the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. Oh, uh, intro 7158 sponsored by Council Member Levin would designate a Chief Geospatial Information Officer within DOIT and require to implement a special data interoperability strategy that would include the city's use of geospatial information systems, very important. Uh, uh, intro 2305, sponsored by me, would require the mayor to designate a city agency to conduct a study to access, to, I'm sorry, a study to assess the, and determine the feasibility of a pilot program to establish a digital identification program for the city of New York. And intro 2358, also sponsored by me, would require do it to create a single mobile application that would allow the public to access services provided uh, by different city agencies, which uh, again, it's, um, uh, that's important to um, be able to communicate with uh, different city agencies to see what's available. So instead of forcing our city's residents to hop from web page to web page to find solutions to their problems, having a single access point through which New Yorkers could log in and access city services would help to improve New Yorkers' abilities to keep track of and request city services. Technology and government has incredible potential to benefit the public. Understanding the risks associated with the use of technology, such as privacy, and security is essential to maximize the potential uh, benefits of technology and government. We look forward to discussing the advantages uh, and concerns surrounding government and technology and anticipate valuable uh, testimonies from the administration, uh, experts, and community advocates uh, uh, on these essential issues. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, members of the committee who are present. We have council member Yeager, uh, Council Member Lander, is he on? I don't see him yet. Um, and I think that's about it. We're expecting council members to come on uh, soon. Uh, so I'll now turn, I'll turn it over to my colleague from Brooklyn, a good friend, Council Member Steve Levin, who will make a statement about his bill. Steve, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Holden. I wanna thank uh, um, Chair and my, and my friend from Queens, uh, Chair Bob Holden for um, not only for conducting this hearing, but for um, allowing this bill to be heard and for co-sponsoring it. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, um, this bill, uh, uh, Intro 2158, uh, would create, as the Chair said, a, a Chief Geospatial Information, Information Officer within the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, otherwise known as DOIT. 
A geographic information system, otherwise known as GIS, is a system that creates, manages, analyzes, and maps all types of data. We currently use GIS to track data across our city agencies for things like DOHMH's Community Health Survey, and this bill will help agencies better share and integrate their data for efficient emergency management responses. Uh, another way of thinking about it, GIS is used for things like Google Maps or Waze or any, any other uh, um, uh, weather.com and looking at uh, storms that are coming in. Any, any type of, um, uh, of geospatial mapping is using GIS technology. And so it's a very important part of our, uh, 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 of our, of our lives. Um, I want to thank uh, the leadership of the GIS community. Thanks to the leadership of the GIS community. Um, we learned after 9-11 how important the need for comprehensive citywide GIS leadership is. Um, led by two friends of, of mine, um, Wendy Dorf and Al Leidner, the system made it possible for a coordinated response by over 50 agencies citywide and helped to lead the New York City Open Data Program. And recently, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown more than ever that we need integrated, transparent, and timely data about our city. The urgent need for GIS interoperability was continually reaffirmed during this pandemic. Geospatial data was critical for the Office of Emergency Management to assess where cases were rising, where greater testing was needed, and where the city should be investing its resources all in real time greater interoperability, we could have better connected data from agencies like NYCHA and Immigrant Affairs with health and emergency services to ensure that vaccines and resources were reaching the neighborhoods and communities most at risk. And now, as we plan for a future with increasing climate challenges, the need for comprehensive data and data sharing is essential. Geospatial data allows us to map stormwater levels, underground infrastructure capacity, and flood pattern changes. And greater interoperability between agencies allows us to better prepare our city for disaster response through coordination and accuracy. The flooding our city faced just weeks ago is a wake up call. We need to better connect geospatial data and underground mapping with first responders. Otherwise, we will continue to be too slow to protect our communities. We need community-based solutions for resiliency, and that requires deepening our investment in underground infrastructure that could easily be translated with local environmental responses. When it comes to disaster planning, breaking down silos would will be a matter of life and death, no doubt. Um, I, I wanna th acknowledge and thank the leadership of uh, Gizmo uh, who helped uh, us work on this legislation and is on the front lines of using underground infrastructure mapping tools to help us build the sustainable future that we need. Um, the climate crisis is here and GIS has an, a critical role to play in planning New York City's future. So again, I wanna thank um, uh, my friend and chair, Bob Holden, um, Borough President Gail Brewer, uh, Council Member Ben Kalos for the support of this legislation. Um, and again, I just want to, uh, in particular, thank um, uh, Wendy Dorf and Al Leidner, um, who I've been um, talking with about GIS issues, uh, goodness, for easily the past seven, eight years at this point. Um, and uh, uh, they've uh, really welcomed me into the, the GIS community and, and helped show me um, uh, just how vital these uh, 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 this technology is and, and how impactful and life-saving it can be in our city. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Levin. And by the way, I just want to say, uh, echo what you just said about Alan and Wendy. They're amazing. And uh, I've been on, you know, with them uh, a few meetings. We had a few meetings and certainly a few calls. So um, they're, they're so valuable for the city of New York, especially now. And um, so let, let's, um, I, I let's uh, hold on one second. Uh, is well, President Brewer, is she, Gail Brewer on? Oh, there she is. Okay, now I see her. She's waving. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'd like, I'd like to introduce uh, Borough President Brewer. She will um, talk about, um, uh, I, so I guess, a bill that you, you're, you're behind. Okay. Yes. Do you want me to wait, sir, until you, uh, or do you want me to go? Whatever you'd no, like. You can go. You can go. Okay. 
So uh, I certainly want to thank you, Chair Holden, and the committees. I am Gail Brewer, the Manhattan Borough President, and I co-sponsored uh, 2158 2020. It is to establish a chief geospatial information officer within Do It. We all know that's the Department of Information and Technology. And I did this with Council Member Stephen Levitt. And I also want to thank your committee. You know, it has very special meaning for me. <laughs> Using geospatial information systems, GIS, means improving and standardizing the use of granular location data as critical components of data sets. It can create maps and visualize patterns of information across New York City agency functions. And I know later on you'll hear from Alan Leidner, Al Leidner, as we call him. I don't know that there's a greater tech GIS human being in the world. So he will have much more to say than I do. He is my hero. And I'm so honored that he's speaking here today in support of this bill. But this, uh, if enacted, this bill would allow the city to overlay a variety of information from different organizations based on common location. It is the common data language that allows our information to work together and improve our shared efforts. New York City government, thanks to Al Leidner, I have to say, has been the beneficiary of more than 35 years of GIS use, and GIS is a key component of 9-11, of 3-11, meaning the database and the, everything of 59 Maiden Lane, and hundreds of other applications used by city agencies. GIS has assisted city responses to disasters. I remember when Al Leidner even went to New Orleans to help them with their GIS system. Obviously, he helped and others on 9-11 and all of our hurricanes. Ensuring relief efforts were supported by crucial location information and emergency responders could avoid unnecessary harm. Over the course of the pandemic, Johns Hopkins applied GIS technology with city and state contact tracing efforts across the country to help inform healthcare officials of how quickly COVID was spreading and where. And we know Johns Hopkins was the place uh, of information more than any other site. Development, maintenance, and use of GIS requires the work of many agencies alongside DOIT and requires clear management and direction to be implemented properly. Effective city services require close collaboration and coordination between agencies in a shared language, as I said earlier. And when I sponsored Local Law 11 of 2012, as you know well, establishing the open data portal, our goal was to ensure transparency and accountability between the government and the public. But one of the greatest impacts of open data over the last nine years has been enhanced interagency operability. Agencies now have access to helpful information in an instant, and staff can approach each other with data based inquiries. Advancing the common technological and data language through GIS is a key step in improving government agencies. And this is particularly important to me because something called Gizmo, which is the uh, oversight agency of all the GIS folks in the city of New York, if not around the country. I think I was there with one of the first meetings, all thanks to Outlet Leidner. So we do have a very special need and understanding of GIS. This legislation, 2158, will restore the necessary management structure to ensure GIS continues to deliver billions of dollars worth of benefits to New Yorkers with a central direction under the CGIO, meaning those that are interested in a GIS information officer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate talking about something that has a lot of meaning to me and I hope will be helpful in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Borough President Brewer. I just want to um, recognize that we've been joined by Councilmember Paul Ballone. And uh, did, uh, is I, uh, Irene, is, um, is Councilmember Rosenthal available? Councilmember Rosenthal, can you speak? Can you hear us? Yep, absolutely. Thank okay. you. Okay, Helen, do you want you, yeah, can you talk about your bill? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you, Councilmember Holden, for holding this hearing. I love the bills that you're sponsoring, and um, I hope this bill. Uh, I appreciate you're including this bill in your this package. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to talk about my bill 1133. 
Um, this is a transparency bill that requires DOIT to maintain a public online searchable database that houses updated information on all oath violations. So several agencies issue violations, which um, then uh, people have to go through oath to settle the situation. Um, the Department of Buildings, Sanitation, Environmental Protection, Consumer and Worker Protection, Health and Mental Hygiene, as well as TLC violations go through oath. So the idea is to have a portal that would be up to date and um, allow anyone to see the status of a violation. And while you can go on open the open data portal uh, to get some of this information, it's very challenging to navigate. And with 1133, I'm optimistic that we can work with do it um, with the existing portal and improve on it to make the information accessible to the general public with a more user friendly interface. And let me give you a specific um, example. In our district, there are um, unfortunately building owners who intentionally don't think don't fix things for which they're getting Department of Buildings violations. For example, having a broken boiler or um, gas piping system that means that for years, tenants don't have heat and hot water. And the building owner might get violation after violation after violation for this. They go to oath and they say, oh yes, after all these years, we've now replaced uh, the boiler and it's fixed. And yes, we have $60,000 worth of violations, but now we've repaired it and it cost us $60,000 to fix the situation. And then the old trial lawyer will say, um, the administrative judge will say, great, so we're gonna wipe out all of the cost of your fines because you fixed this situation. Well, what if that is the case, what incentive is there for any building owner to actually fix something quickly? The violations really have no meaning. And what this bill intends to do is give transparency to those situations and perhaps allow the tenants that have had to live under a situation um, where they've had no heat or hot water to give it as an opportunity for those tenants to weigh in on the reality of their lives because the um, building owners are not really heeding the violations um, or what the Department of Buildings seeks for the landlord to fix. I know that sounds like a long story and it sounds like a terrible situation. It happens over and over and over again in our district. And that's why we've brought this um, piece of legislation forward. It's why I appreciate Chair Holden including this legislation in this package of bills. And I wanna thank him and my district office staff and the legislative staff for working so diligently with um, our offers, our office to get uh, to help those New Yorkers um, who are trying to get justice um, with these violations. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you and appreciate your hearing the bill. Thank you so much, Chair Holden. And, uh, and thank you, Council Member Rosenthal, for this bill because uh, I have a lot of experience with this where there's no accountability. It's just cost of doing business, some of these uh, landlords uh, and, and, and many, many other fines that are levied. They pay the fine and it doesn't get corrected. So this is, mm. we can add to transparency is important uh, in this thank system. Thank you. To really, so I appreciate this bill. And again, thank you for this. Um, and I will now turn it over to committee counsel, Irene Bohosky, who took over some procedural items. 
Thank you, Chair Holden. I'm Irene Bajewski, the Council to the Committee on Technology, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify. After you're called on, you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called as I announce the panelists. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the room Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you. We will be limiting council members' questions to five minutes. This includes both questions and answers. All public testimony will be also limited to five minutes. And after I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the surgeon at arm to an arms to announce that you might begin before starting your testimony. I will now call representative of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony today from the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunication, Robin Levin. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Please, Ms. Levin, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the, but the truth before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. You may begin when you're ready. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Holden, members of the City Council Committee on Technology and Borough President Brewer. My name is Robin Levine, and I am the Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs and Communications for the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, also known as DOIT. Uh, Commissioner Tisch is going to try to join the Q&A, but she had a scheduling conflict, so I'm here delivering testimony. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss the legislation on the committee's docket today. First, I will discuss intro 1133 by Councilmember Rosenthal. This legislation would require DOIT to create a database to track HPD and oath violations from issuance to resolution and would also require quarterly reporting on the progress of such database. It's my understanding that much of the information this bill calls for is already publicly accessible through HPD online and the open data portal. So this database may duplicate what is currently already available. Next, I will discuss intro 2158, council member Levin's legislation submitted by request of Manhattan Borough President Brewer. This bill would require do it to appoint a chief GIS officer who would be required to lead an annual interagency meeting of citywide GIS personnel. Do it would have the responsibility to develop, maintain, and implement a spatial data strategy and a strategic plan for the use of GIS by agencies. This legislation would solidify do its leadership role in this area and creates an avenue for useful cross agency coordination. In fact, do it plans to move forward on a massive upgrade to the city's GIS system, NextGen GIS. We will be working with Esri, a leading company in GIS capabilities. The first phase of work will be updating GIS in 311 to allow for more precise mapping of service requests. Particularly, there have been issues with SRs, service requests, in parks and on highways where there is not a precise street address. The first phase of this upgrade will address that problem. I want to thank the city council and in, and in particular Chair Holden and Council Member Drum for calling this issue to our attention. We also have begun the process to hire a director of GIS at Do It. That person will oversee the implementation of next gen GIS. Commissioner Tisch plans for that per person to report directly to the Deputy Commissioner of Data and Applications. As we are already in the process of hiring an executive who will be exclusively dedicated to next-gen GIS, we are pleased that the council recognizes its importance. However, we would like to discuss changes to the bill's language to best place this officer within DOIT's organizational structure. Next, 
Chair Holden's bill, intro 2305, would require the administration to conduct a study to assess and determine the feasibility of a pilot program to establish a digital identification program. This is an interesting idea that we want to look more into. We'd like to hear more about the program's goals and what the council envisions with such a study so that we can better assess the idea. Finally, intro 2358, also sponsored by Chair Holden, would require do it to create a single mobile application capable of allowing members of the public to access services provided by a city agency. This is certainly an ambitious big picture proposal that has merit, but this is a top to bottom overhaul of most digital city services as we know them today. I would not be able to sit here and tell you that this would be an easy or inexpensive undertaking. This proposal would take a significant investment in time, budget, and personnel across nearly every city agency to accomplish. This would not be do its task alone, and many other stakeholders would also need to be part of the conversation. That said, do it wants to continue to work with the council as we have done in the past to update and, in, and improve the experience of 311 in the short term. As Chair Holden and the council know, since Commissioner Tish took the helmet do it, we have prioritized council feedback and used it to help guide enhancements and upgrades to the 311 system, including photo upload capabilities for more service requests and allowing non-account holders to receive email alerts for service requests. If you have any other improvements we can take up immediately, I'd be happy to discuss those with the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I will now take council members' questions. And uh, as I said, I think Commissioner Tish will be here soon as well to also take that questions. Thank I, you. I see the commissioners on. You want to, uh, Irene? You want to give the read the affirmation to the commissioner? Thank you. Absolutely, Council Member Holden. Commissioner Tish. Hi. Hello. Um, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Holden, you might begin your questions. Yes, welcome, Commissioner. I know you have a tight schedule and I appreciate you stopping by again. And uh, um, I just have a few questions and then we'll get into some of the questions on the uh, particular bills, but um, it's a general question. Uh, can you, can you have, a, do you have any updates on Link NYC deal that, uh, you know, we talked about and that's been, uh, you know, going forward, thanks to you and uh, the cooperation with the administration and uh, everyone involved? I sure do. Um, so we've been working very closely with City Bridge um, to do an updated design of the new link kiosks that will support 5G. We hope to um, have that design to the Public Design Commission for their October meeting, which is very ambitious. As part of that process, as you know, it's an open process. So the design um, will be circulated to all city council members, community boards for feedback. And so I expect really to have a, a design that you can lay your eyes on that, that we're ready to submit uh, for, the, for the October hearing of the Public Design Commission. Great, so what, what's, what's your estimate on when we could realize these new kiosks actually on the streets? So, and with the 5G. Yeah, um, that will depend a lot on one, whether this design gets approved at the October meeting, and then two, how long they will take to manufacture. So I can't get manufacturing estimates until I have an approved design. So I wanna see that approved design. Nonetheless, council member, what we're doing because we want to, I'm sorry, chair. What, we, what we're doing is um, we are green lighting new locations, working with the borough president's office. And now based on your feedback, we're revising that process to also include all of um, the uh, 
council members in uh, yeah, I guess because we're forgotten a lot. So no, no, you know, I have to forget you. <laughs> um, but we have green lighted um, the installation of approximately 50 new kiosks all outside of, of Manhattan. Um, and if the new design isn't ready for the install, we're, we'll install with the old and then can look at a, a retrofit process but we really wanted to take the opportunity to get this program up and running again. I'm also really pleased to tell you that City Bridge sent uh, us um, a check for $26 million, which is what they owed us in their back payment under the terms of the new franchise agreement. So, so far, so good. Great, okay. So I have a general question. Uh, right now, where can the public go if they have questions regarding New York City's government's use of technology besides, you know, filing a FOIL request? You know, so. To, so I'm, I'm not sure. Well, let me say this. Right now, there are two portals that I can think of where New Yorkers can go to access um, online services provided by the city. And the two main ones that I'm thinking of are 311 and Access NYC. Now, when I say that, um, those are cross agency platforms. So you can go to those two platforms and in the case of Access NYC, you can see all benefit programs offered by various city agencies. And when you go to 311, you can see a lot of different uh, services offered by New York City. Um, but um, neither of them fill the void that I think that this legislation is designed um, to close, which is a single unified platform where no matter what the service is that, that can be delivered or applied for online, a single platform that just houses all of that cross agency. Right, so, you know, and that's, that is a, a large task, but does, does like uh, does do it or any city agency currently have public forums, for instance, uh, on how technology can be leveraged uh, to improve government efficiency? I mean, do we get that feedback? You know, I think perhaps the CTO's office has that. I'm not sure, but that would be something that would be in their lane. And I apologize that I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head, but we can certainly circle back with you on it. Okay, that, that's, uh, that's good. Intro uh, 1133, um, it's, you know, it's a local law to amend the New York City Charter in relation to the creation of a database to track violations, as you know, uh, from the time it's issued to the resolution, which I think is very important. Does do it have the staff necessary to carry this out now if the legislation passes? So that piece of legislation speaks to, I think is focused on HPD. And so the way an HPD and the violations that they write, um, generally um, each individual agency would publish that data. Um, some of it is available on open data, but if you want more granular reporting of it online, that would be something that HPD could do. Do it could also do it. It's just not the model that's been used historically. Um, and do we have the staff to do it? As you know, our staffing numbers um, are lower than they once once were. But you know, anything is possible. It's all a, a question of of priority. And so, if this was the big priority, sure, we would have the staff to do it. All right. Does the administration support this bill? I can tell you that um, a lot of the data that is requested in this bill is already available on HPD's 
website to the extent that there are data elements that are not available or today, or um, if there's feedback that the user interface for HPD online isn't smooth enough, certainly happy to take that back and work with you and the council to get those data elements added and uh, ensure that the user experience is, is good. Okay, uh, I see uh, Council Member Rosenthal has her hand up. I think it's on this bill, so um, I'll recognize Council Member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Holden. I appreciate it. And, you know, uh, um, uh, Director. Uh, Commissioner Tish, uh, it's always a, always a pleasure to work with you. I know how hard you're working to keep the city, um, you know, uh, connected and, and all of our um, IT functioning well. You know, I'm not sure that the language in this bill exactly captured the need. So I'm going to um, ask you about where I'd like to get to, if, sure. if even if this bill didn't quite capture it, and we don't always need legislation to get things done. Um, what, what I'm looking for is a tool that would track um, uh, violation, you know, by violation number uh, from soup to nuts, from the time it's issued to the time that uh, the violation is either dismissed or paid. And it's to deal with the problem that um, these violations are issued, but for one reason or another, the, the, the property here in the, in the case that I usually think about, a property, you know, ends up not, you know, that the violation or the fees are waived um, but really shouldn't be waived. Um, and the system is set up in such a way that the fees are waived and the violation fees are waived, fees and fines are waived without, you know, the, the public or the person who made the original call to get the violation issued without them having any knowledge of what ends up happening there. And so one, we're looking for transparency and, you know, I could imagine a report that, you know, sort of um, captures the information by, you know, the number of, you know, a property owner, the number, the number of fines versus what they actually paid, the delta from highest to lowest. Do you know what I mean? Like that's how I would want to track it so we could know who is it that's getting away with this and why and should it be fixed? Because in our situation, the example I gave before you locked on was a building owner who doesn't provide heat and wa hot water for three years keeps getting issued violations, doesn't really do anything about it, but finally maybe gets a boiler and repairs it and then goes to a judge and administrative trial judge and says, yeah, you know, I've racked up $60,000 in fines, but the cost of my new boiler was $60,000. And then the trial judge waives all the fines. So I, that, yeah, that's sort of what we're looking to get at. So that, that context is, is super helpful and you're right because I, I reviewed HPD online when we were preparing for this, this hearing and that type of information that, that you're looking for is not on there. So question, the question, if the question is like, is that feasible? The answer is sure. I mean, that's not, that's not rocket science. Um, I think the difference um, or, or the, the, the complexity here is that we're just marrying data sets 
potentially housed by different agencies. So we would have to take, we'd have to get from oath the, the data you're talking about, meaning was the fine raised, et cetera. So I don't wanna sit here and say like, yes, absolutely, this is a home run slam dunk, but this does seem quite achievable. And um, now that I understand the, the purpose and the context, um, can be more thoughtful about how to achieve it. Thank you. I appreciate that and look forward to working with you offline. Great. And, and, and that's why I have a legislation to create a single app to, to deal with a lot of these issues. So uh, anyway. Um, Even uh, better. Thank you, Chair Holden. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I just, um, I just want to go over a couple of things with um, a couple of questions on uh, intro uh, 2158, um, which is obviously a local law to amend the New York City Charter in relation to designating a geospatial information officer. Did, did you try to hire someone uh, a while ago, uh, a GIS officer? I did. Uh, this was at the very beginning. We had a great candidate who ended up backing out. This was the very beginning when I took over like almost two years ago. Um, then COVID happened. Um, we actually now, as I think um, Robin mentioned, are finally in the process of hiring a chief GIS officer, which I'm really excited about. Um, and it's actually very well timed because um, we are about to embark on a massive overhaul of the city's GIS system. And uh, to bring it up to I mean, modern standards, so next-gen GIS. Um, and we're working with a company called Esri, which is really a leader in that space. Actually, the CEO of Esri was in my office today and we were just talking about it. He was in from California. So um, we're gonna go full throttle on upgrading the city's GIS systems. And I agree 100% that there should be a chief GIS officer at the agency. My quibble with the bill, and I feel like we could probably handle this offline among staff if, it, if, if it's okay with you, is the way that it's written now, it says one, that that person has to be a deputy commissioner. And then two, it limits the number of deputy commissioners that the agency, my agency can have to four or five. I have more deputy commissioners than that now, just because the portfolio of the agency is so large. So totally agree with the spirit and intent of the legislation. Just wanna work on those two wording areas. All right, well, I wanna bring in, cause it's his bill. I wanna bring in uh, council member Levin to, I think he has some questions uh, on the bill. Sure thing. Great. Thank you, chair. Um, and uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I, I greatly appreciate um, uh, your remarks. And um, in a lot of ways, it, it lines up with um, what um, we've been talking about. And, and I think if you can stay on for a few minutes after uh, uh, answering questions, uh, you'll probably hear from Al Leidner. And I don't know if Wendy Dorf is on, on the Zoom call as well, but the folks that I've been working with for, for a long time on this legislation and, you, and it's it 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 it's clear to me that we're, you know we're reading out of the same playbook, so that's that's very good. And uh, I just also want to acknowledge Gail Brewer, who um, has been, um, uh, you know, kind of holding my hand through understanding uh, um, GIS issues uh, for the last twelve years. So I just want to thank Gail for that. Um, uh, and I, so I just want to be clear that so so you you see the legislation not as being. Um, uh, helpful towards your um, aims, notwithstanding those two issues that you just mentioned, the the, the legislation could be useful um, in codifying, I think, uh, some of your ob uh, objectives that I think you're moving towards anyway. Is that, what you, is that true? Absolutely. And I think that we both 
agree that there is so much that we can do with GIS data to one, be more transparent and to better serve New Yorkers generally. So right now, the, a lot of the GIS data in the city is siloed. So it lives inside an agency, but you can't map different data sources on top of each other. And being able to do that is incredibly powerful. And so the whole point of this upgrade of the GIS system or the larger vision is to be able to allow interagency sharing of GIS data and to be able to share much of that with the public in a streamlined and modern and easy to use way. The implications for open data of this initiative are also massive. So I am fully supportive of the spirit of this bill, for sure. I was delighted to see it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, uh, do, do, have you spoken with OEM? Have they, uh, are, have, have they weighed in at all with you on the bill? I have not personally spoken to OEM, no, about this one, but I don't, I don't see how creating a technology platform for GIS could be controversial in 2021. I mean, I would expect that they would, that they would be supportive, <laughs> would be my guess. I just want to make sure. Sure. Especially after what we've been through, you know, the past year and a half with with COVID data and, and mapping, like that really brought that to brought the, the power of, of GIS to the full. Oh, for sure, for sure. I, I go to the the city COVID map uh, every week to see what what um, what communities, what zip codes are are lagging behind in terms of vaccination rates. I mean, it's it's you know just as a small example. Um, have when you mentioned um, you know the need to have um, you know that that um, interconnectivity with data sets. Um, have you um, uh, were you able to see any limitations in the city's response to COVID, or more recently in the storm, uh, the the the, the uh, Hurricane Ida or Henri that that. Um, that where there are limitations um, to the city's response because of that siloed nature of data? So I was not deeply involved in the response to Ida, so I don't wanna speak to limitations, um, but what I can tell you is not controversial at all, that being able to see data, real-time data sets overlapped with each other, absolutely 100% enhances responses to anything. So before I came to do it for the previous like decade plus, I worked at NYPD as their, their CIO. And I saw firsthand how breaking down silos between data sets and being able to view different data, data sets together changed um, NYPD's response to incidents. So I, I do think that there are a lot of possibilities um, to do to have real benefits for operational response by having these enhanced GIS capabilities, which is why that's what we're working on now. And then Chair, just last question uh, briefly, and I, just because it's, it's uh, timely. Um, this week, it was announced that Google is going to be um, investing heavily in, in new office space in New York City, and they've they've obviously been, um, um, you know, of, of any company that I could, the private company that I could think of, um, you know, the, the the most ingrained in this conversation. And so, I just wanted to see if if we if you've been able to have any um, uh, conversations with with the team at Google and ways in which they can be helpful in, in the uh, next gen GIS? So we're in touch with Google a lot and they've been an extraordinary partner to us. I have not spoken to them directly on GIS, but um, I appreciate the 
heads up tip and definitely will make a point of speaking to Google about GIS, especially as we're just embarking on this now because we wanna build a capability for the future, not just for today and wanna make sure that as we lay the foundation for it, we get it right. I could just I just know that a few years back, uh, Al and Wendy invited me to a gizmo conference that was hosted by Google and you know they were um, uh, they they really are interested, I think, in taking a leadership role. Cool. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you, Commissioner. See ya, thank you. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you, Council Member Levin. I uh, just want to just to follow up on the GIS uh, Commissioner. Um, we could have warned people that they're in a low-lying area or, or, or could have been susceptible, to obviously, to flooding. Uh, I have um, an underpass that always floods, but with this kind of rain, it was under 15 feet of water and people were trapped uh, in their cars. And we got, we got, luckily the fire department got them out, but we can, with the GIS, we can predict, you know, with a, with a hurricane coming or, or a tropical storm, we can predict in real time you know, what areas will get flooded or at least uh, more prone and we can warn people. We didn't do that. You know, we gave general areas, uh, you know, southeastern Queens or whatever, you know, whatever we give general areas, but we could actually pinpoint exact streets, right, with this. Um, yeah, I mean, I, again, I wasn't, I wasn't involved. I'm not blaming you. No, I'm not saying you. I'm just saying. No, I'm not talking about blame. I, I just, I'm not comfortable speaking about the city's response when I wasn't involved in it. No, so I'm talking I, about the technology. I'm not talking about, I'm, I'm just talking about the advantages of GIS. Yeah, certainly, certainly, there, certainly um, one of the capabilities that GIS gives you or having GIS systems gives you is exactly what what you described i just i can't speak to whether or not oem had those capabilities what they warned on etc you know they they do oem i'm almost certain has that type of mapping available to oem so what i'm what i'm talking about is building a new citywide gis system that other agencies can use to share data sets that being one of them right but that that's in, in basic just to, for the lay person who you know what benefit does this have it, it it goes across not only in the pandemic but it goes across uh, disasters and without a doubt and even storm surges and things like that that we could warn people in real time and um uh and really save lives i mean that's what it's about and make you know make obviously we can even, they can even pinpoint what um, subway, you know, stations would flood, uh, which, uh, you know, and warn people. And we saw people waiting in, in four feet of water going down the steps to, to get a train, to get a subway. Um, and that could be avoided in the future. So I'm just, I'm just letting people know that there are tremendous advantages to this. And that's where the city should invest in, uh, especially in light of what happened in, in, uh, in the last, Few years with storms and so forth and pandemics. Um, I, I think uh, Council Member Yeager has a question. I see his Time name. starts now. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm not, not sure this is going to really result in a question, but I do want to make the record clear on a couple of things. First of all, on the uh, intro 2158, Commissioner, I, I share your concern, um, uh, and it's the reason that I'm not co sponsoring it. I honestly don't care who you hire, who you don't hire, but what I don't like is uh, that the language changed from the current language uh, that the commissioner may appoint four deputies to shall appoint five deputies. And if you or a future commissioner thinks that you can do the job with one deputy, that's fine with one deputy, that's fine by me too. So I'm not sure why a legislative body thinks we ought to be telling commissioners how many deputies uh, he or she needs. Seems to me it's pretty a pretty dumb thing for us to do. So not supporting it for that reason. And uh, I'm hopeful that it doesn't pass unless the language changes. Um, uh, whether or not you choose to have that kind of position filled, I think that the council does have the authority and uh, to, to suggest, to tell agencies what kind of work we believe they should do, but not to tell you who to hire and who not to hire and what kind of positions you should have. Um, 
uh, on intro 2358, I'm co-sponsoring that uh, Councilman Holden's wise legislation. Um, you know, this is this is one of those things where I think we've seen uh, as the city's, you know, under under Mayor Bloomberg, the city wisely created the 311 system. I think uh, for many respects, the you know Mayor Bloomberg saw that over time the city had gone from a a proactive uh, a municipality that went around fixing the things that it's owned to a reactive uh, where it awaited until it broke down uh, and and chaos ensued. And so the mayor created the system wisely uh, with the technology available then to allow New Yorkers to report what they saw. Um, we're now at the point where the city's actually, uh, without question in my mind, taken a complete hands off uh, uh, um, approach to its own infrastructure. The city doesn't care what breaks, what doesn't break. It's not interested in it. If a New Yorker reports it, then maybe one day the city will get to fixing it or not. So creating a system where New Yorkers can easily get into uh, reporting without having to go from one website to another website to another website, which actually does happen. You know, the 311 moves you around to different places, uh, I think makes a lot of sense. And the ability to track what ultimately happens um, is probably a good idea, but I'm going to leave the technological part of that up to you because I don't know enough about it. Um, uh, intro 1133 is one of those times that uh, I guess different legislators come to the same conclusion by taking different roads. Uh, I agree with the with the language in the bill, but not for the reasons that Council Member Rosenthal stated. I don't know that I could find the time that I've ever seen um, a victim of aggressive summonsing walk into oath and say, I fixed what I got the summonses for. Now, please forgive me. And oath said, sure, have a great day. Um, I, I don't know that anybody's ever seen that. So the example of the $60,000 fine and the boilers, I'd love to know more about that. Um, but what I did find last year was the city uh, sent an alphabet soup a litany of quota agents roaming around the city to issue what the United States Supreme Court ultimately held to be an unconstitutional scheme of summonsing. And in trying to track down through oath uh, which different agencies were issuing these summonses, a lot of that uh, I learned turned into the sheriff himself having to go through an Excel spreadsheet of summonses, uh, whereas the Department of Buildings, we couldn't figure it out because the Commissioner of Buildings didn't bother docketing his summonses. Um, and the Commissioner of Oath really couldn't get a straight number of how many summonses we're charging uh, the victimized New Yorkers with this unconstitutional um, uh, scheme of summonsing. Uh, ultimately, it, it's all worked itself out for the most part, but I think that the idea of getting everything into one place where people can actually see what happens from summons till the end, not so much for the point that um, my colleague brought up, because I think that, uh, and I do want to mention this, the idea that uh, somebody gets a summons for something being broken, and then they go and fix it and that it's wrong for them to ask for forgiveness for the penalty that had come about from it being broken in the first place seems to me uh, to be the wrong approach. The idea about summonsing in this city ought to be to encourage people to fix things, not to raise money from the taxpayers of New York. And what we found in, in the methods that we have done our budgeting is that too often we no longer, we rely less and less on tax revenue and more and more on the punishing summonses that we issue to New Yorkers. So putting that information all in one place, again, as I said, is um, perhaps uh, different, different uh, methods of traveling to the same destination. So uh, right. I'm glad to know that you believe that you can get that done relatively quickly. Uh, it's not rocket science, as you said, but uh, I believe even if it were, you could probably get it done. So I'm not leaving you with any questions other than to wish you a Chag Sameach, but I just wanted to uh, uh, have some of those thoughts on the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Chag Sameach to you, too. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember Yeager. I see Councilmember Ballon has his hands up. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Holden, and to the council members. Good to see you, Commissioner. Good to see you. So, I mean, Chair Holden's been, been pushing these uh, conversations for modernizing and getting to the point that we all seem to want to be, which is the next generation. And you just said yourself, you know, you're looking forward to the interagency connection of all this. And, you know, you've got, you see the bills coming in different forms, all kind of leading us to that path. But 
like Chair Holden and Councilmember Rosenthal said, maybe we can do without the legislation. But I, what I'm not hearing from you, and maybe you can clarify, is like a timeline. Do you see this happening, this vision that you've been talking about since we've been having these hearings about the next generation and that interagency? And it's, it sounds so tantalizing, and it's what we want, and we want that extra speed, and we want to be able, like Chair Holden said, when it's emergencies, get, you know, get our constituents information and not rely on these ridiculous weather people that tell me at seven o'clock at night that the rain's coming tomorrow and we all get flooded at 10 o'clock at night. So, you know, there's got to be a way that we can protect a little bit better with the technology we have. So I just wanted to give you maybe another opportunity on your vision of when that would happen. Sure. And, and when do you see that coming? Absolutely. So I um, expect to get final budget approval and contract in place uh, in the next maybe two, three weeks, which is fantastic. And then uh, phase one is gonna be fixing um, 311, which is something important that Chair Holden and um, Chair Drum brought to my attention, which is in the 311 system, if you're, if you're not putting in a street address, you're putting in like a park address, like a place in a park or on a highway, the GIS system sometimes is imprecise. So we're gonna fix that. That will be fixed, like I would say two months from when this gets approved. But in terms of like the, the rip and replace and build a new GIS system, you can see that in 2022. In calendar year 2022, the city of New York will have certainly the foundations of a brand new next gen GIS system in place. And then what will happen is over time, like as agencies add more layers and maps uh, and data to it, it just grows and grows and becomes even more powerful. But the city of New York will have a new next gen GIS system in calendar year 2022. Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry, I didn't realize it was going back and forth. But, but that's where the, like you just threw in at the end, the stuff that drives, I mean, whatever, whatever hearing I'm on, when I hear the interagency layering and not being in control of what that means always drove me crazy because it then becomes something out of your hands because other agencies are putting layers on top. Will you be in control of the growth of the next generation so that as the layering and as it evolves, it'll still go through, do it? Or is it going to grow into an interagency? Each agency is going to have. No. So here's, so here's the thing. I won't own the data. Right, so each agency has their own data. And what each agency will be able to do is contribute data and, and layers and maps to the citywide next gen GIS system. And so you are Shouldn't correct. that be through, shouldn't that through be through your, it seems like there's that just gonna open the door for a little bit of confusion or or how, who's in control of what. I would think that you, as the commissioner of the agency, should somehow be in charge of that layering so that there's always a central guiding agency over this. It just seems to be, that even two years from now, we're gonna have a conversation, well, wait a minute, DOT just put, and Parks just put, but we didn't know they put it on. And in fact, yeah, it just gets, seems to be a little bit, it seems like everything should be going through you. I understand that point. Anyway, I, I'm happy that the next budget in the next couple of weeks and we're going to start seeing changes. But if you can, uh, especially with the transition with the new council coming in, I think this progress will be very helpful as to where we are today, two weeks from now, and as the vision of the next the next crew comes in. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. But thank you, Chair Roland, and thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, thank you, Council Member Malone. By the way, I just want to echo what you just said about we get information we were up during the storm, during the, uh, the wee hours, getting information from the city council as to what's happening. We'd get also uh, from the city, but it was ac actually after the fact. So, you know, people were trapped or people were cut off. So it needs to be in real time, but we need actually something that predicts, you know, that we can stay away from this area, you know, before, hours before, days before, 
we know that a storm is coming, avoid this area, or if you're in this area, get out. And, you know, pinpointing, that's what I'm saying, specific streets. So it's very important to get in real time or even predict, which we'll hear about later on in some of the advocates talking about this, but um, it, that, that's essential. We, we, we have to be able to, to get the information and, and actually predict where the problem area is going to be, whether it's in our streets or subways or during a pandemic and, and tracking it. So um, thank you, Councilmember Ballone. And um, I saw a little furry friend that you had, oh, Daisy. Is that Daisy over there? <laughs> okay, Daisy doesn't have a question, so we'll move on. Um, I just wanna, uh, Commissioner, I wanna talk about um, the, the bill, uh, my bill 2358, uh, which would create a centralized mobile application. I know you have some concerns about that. It's a massive project, a lot of money. Um, would you need to hire a vendor for that, to do that? You couldn't do it in-house? So I would, I, I, I have some details of it that I'd like to discuss with you. I agree very much with what I think is the intent of the legislation to make all services, to make all city services that you can access online available in one easy to use place so that you're not going around from agency site to agency site trying to figure it out. So there's one place for it. I agree very much with um, the intent of that bill. From a technology perspective, it's not something that's exceedingly hard to do. It's that the difficulty in that one is just organizing it, you know, getting all the digital assets and the digital services that the city um, provides from all the agencies. There's probably thousands of them and just organizing it in a place where it's easy to consume for New Yorkers and clear what it is. In my mind, this doesn't replace 311, right? So 311 is very different from that. 311 has access to digital services, but it also has like lots of information about things like beyond what, what you would need to or want to fill out or access online. Um, so again, creating it, the, the, the big difficulty is just organizing it. And I think it's also achievable, but um, will require an interagency effort. Yeah, I, you know, I did speak to companies that have this, that, that have done it for other cities and states and, and even countries around the world. So, this, I mean, obviously New York City with all the agencies and all the, you know, there's so much information but we never, many people have trouble, you know, finding it and getting it and, and coordinating it and receiving the services. So anything we could do with technology to make it easier, I think should be looked at. And yes, a vendor would have to probably be called in. But um, I think that it, it we're, you know, if we, if we could study some of the cities that are using it, have, have an app like that, that could solve a lot of problems. Uh, we should look at that, you know, and, and, it, and again, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if do it can, you have, a, you have your plate full now, but um, certainly looking at how to make our lives easier in New York City using technology, that's the really the topic of this hearing, uh, where it will make our, our lives easier and safer with technology. So, um, uh, there, there, yeah, there are risks that we talked about. Uh, I, th I think, uh, Helen, you have, Helen Rosenthal, Council Member Rosenthal has, a, has another question. Yes, thank you so much, Chair Holden. Um, can you hear me all right? We can. Oh, okay, great. Um, Chair Holden, I, I want to make sure I understand um, the intent of your bill and, and sort of what the commissioner is saying, because I, I think this is just such a great idea. It would be so helpful to residents. Are you suggesting that there could be a way so someone could input, say, their home address 
and learn and sorry to be obsessed with violations, but learn what each agency is doing at that address. So in other words, we often see that at a particular address, um, there are violations being issued from DEP, DOH, um, HPD and DOB, the fire department, et cetera. But you can never see, especially for DOB, except for DOB and HPD, you can't see whether or not these things are ever addressed, whether or not an inspector goes out or um, whether or not it gets fixed. Is that what you're both talking about, having the capacity to look by address to see what all agencies are doing? My understanding of it and what I was responding to was something a little different it, or a lot different. It was just having a digital catalog of all the different um, agency websites you can go to to, to get oh. a request a service. Got it. All right. Never mind then. <laughs> because I've been talking about this idea with, uh, we have a task force through the Department of Buildings where we pull together all the agencies, DEP, DOH. And we've noticed that DEP and DOH don't even, you can't even look up anything by address to see what they're doing. Um, so I don't want to hijack the conversation, but another time I'd love to talk to you about talk with you about the feasibility of that, or Councilmember Holden will expand his legislation to include that. Again, <laughs> Thank you so much. Again, this is you know the sky's the limit with technology. Right? Yeah, you you could um, you could do a lot of things with this. You could pay property taxes. You could um, pay a speeding ticket. I mean, there's there's the, the you know possibilities are endless. Um, Got it. You know, it's one stop shopping, let's say. It's pulling, it's, it's pulling together so many agencies and so much information. Yeah, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. It's not rebuilding. No, the these are that. all existing digital services. They can take them and consolidate them into one yeah. easy to search right. platform where you can find them. Yeah. Right. It's making cool. it easier for people because right now it's impossible to find all this stuff. I mean, you have to really spend hours and hours and days and you still can't find it. So that's all we're saying here. Let's try to design this where it's easier. But this, you know, Helen, the, the, the sky's the limit. Again, you, all the, you know, the, I, I meet with a lot of companies that that say they're doing it now, and we could do it in New York City. So yeah, that's amazing. That's all I'm Thank you, for. Chair Holden. That's all I'm asking for. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, I see. Are there any further questions? Um, I guess we've gone through most of the, all right. So uh, no other questions from council members? No, I don't see any more questions. Okay, well, thank you, commissioner. Thank you for all you do. And uh, looking forward to obviously the, uh, the GIS and, uh, and, and three, improvements on 311. And I, I, I'm always in contact with you about 311 because I use it a lot. Every day I use it five, six times. I can't walk out outside, you know, exercise without seeing things that I have to report to 311. And uh, anything we can make, you know, you know, by the way, let, let me just I'll give you feedback on the photograph. I don't know. Um, you know, when you you allow the 311, you know, photographs for let's say parking violations that I've seen, I don't know why, but I'm seeing it's such a quicker response. Uh, almost immediately, uh, sometimes within an hour. When you add a photograph, and I, I tell my constituents, when you add a photograph, let's say somebody parked at a hydrant or somebody parked in a crosswalk, it's we're getting quicker attention on it. And uh, so I think it, that that's definitely helped. And certainly uh, your groundbreaking text to 911 has been, has been a, a lifesaver. Um, for so many people. So I just want to thank you on that one. I always, I do thank you because you did it on time, even during a pandemic. So in the beginnings of the pandemic, you did that. So thanks commissioner again, looking forward to 
working with you on, on some of these bills and uh, and some more bills in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to turn it back to our, our council committee council, Irene. Bahad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We will now turn to public testimony. I will be calling groups of panelists. One, your name is called. A member of our staff will unmute you, and the surgeon at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting a timer. We ask each panelist to limit their testimony to five minutes. Council members, council members will have an opportunity to ask questions after each panelist has completed testimony. I would like now to welcome our first panelist to testify. We will be hearing testimonies from Ms. Wendy Dort and Alan Leidner from Just Spatial Information System and Mapping Organization, Professor Sean Ahern and Mr. Z. Can he from Bad NYC? Ms. Dorth? Time starts now. Um, this has been an incredible uh, afternoon for me. I almost feel like I'm preaching to the choir now because I've been an advocate with Alan Leidner for an enhanced GIS uh, applications and uh, and uh, data sharing and security issues for the mapping in the city of New York. And uh, it seems today that we have a mass of an agreement on that issue, but I, I, will, I would like to anyway discuss my career with GIS and uh, to say that uh, this is probably one of the best days I've actually ever had and looking forward to the future of this technology. Um, I am a director of Gizmo. Um, I began my career in city government 35 years ago. Uh, for, I, I worked for 35 years, including six years as a legislative analyst at the city council finance unit and 21 years of service at DEP where I directed mapping of the city's water supply system and worked at, on the development of New York City's base map. I directed infrastructure mapping at the emergency mapping and data center following the 9-11 attack. Uh, since then, I consulted for Plan Graphics, a GIS firm, Parsons Brinkhoff, an, inf an infrastructure engineering firm. And currently I serve on the board of directors of Gizmo and president, and I'm president of New York City, New York, New York City Geocats. I am engaged in an international project of the Open Geospatial Consortium to develop a data model for all underground infrastructure. While working at New York City DEP in the mid 1980s, I was tasked with an effort to manage a project to digitize and create a 6,000 mile network of the city's water mains. The budgetary justification for mapping the accurate location of water mains was to coordinate planning and operations and also to facilitate design and construction to reduce excess costs incurred by delays in construction. Further, the city was able to locate a water main break rapidly, property damage and payments associated with damages could be reduced. This could only be accomplished with a network map of water mains made possible with the use of geo geospatial information systems. The successful implementation of the water map for operations at TEP convinced the managers to fund a citywide sewer map layer. New York City is one of the very few cities in the world that has digital maps of its water and sewer systems. I was in charge of underground infrastructure mapping of the World Trade Center site. I worked with TEP, DDC, MTA, Port Authority, Con Edison, Empire City, Subway, et cetera. I collected maps of different scales and media and supervised a team of GIS technicians and engineers assigned to, assigned to align, layer, align and layer the maps for use by the responders as they navigate, navigated the World Trade Center site. It took several weeks to bring all of this information together, but it enabled us to discover a very tank of freon gas threatened by underground fires and enabled us to take measures to avoid the release of phosgene or mustard gas. 
Since 9-11, I have been working on the development of an accurate, integrated underground infrastructure map for first responders. Since 9-11, we have canvassed colleagues, interviewed city agencies, executive, executives, had presentations with utility representatives, et cetera, all of whom agree that this initiative is critical for emergency response and for development of New York New York is at the premier, premier smart city. The project had been stalled due to lack of funding. In the past year, Alan Leinler and I joined a team at NYU CUSP to compete for an NSF Civic Innovation Challenge Grant to support community-based solutions to disaster resilience. We interviewed more than 40 stakeholders, including city agency and utility managers and community leaders. Two very different communities were selected as pilot locations. The stakeholders agreed to share infrastructure data to develop security measures for storing the data. Our team received the NSF award on September 21st this week, 20 years after 9-11. The grant provides our city with an outstanding opportunity to demonstrate the value of utility data sharing in response to it. I'm inspired potential disasters from climate change. City leadership and direction will be needed to assure that the demonstration project will provide guidance in developing a resilience plan. Our efforts in advancing the use of GIS for infrastructure has been seriously impeded by lack of leadership, a lack of planning and difficulties with coordination between city infrastructure agencies and utilities. Yet recent analysis has shown that city infrastructure agencies and utilities could save billions of dollars by having complete, accurate, and interoperable infrastructure data. Available interoperable, interoperable utility data is also critical for disaster planning and res response. I support amendments to, uh, to city, to chapters 48, do it, do it of the city charter as follows. The appointment of a deputy commissioner who serves as the city's chief geospatial information officer, the establishment of a GIS steering committee comprised of agency leaders and other experts, a requirement that city, the city produce and keep up to date a GIS strategic plan, a requirement that spatial data connecting most of the city's open data be standardized, interoperable, and easy to use, and the establishment of an underground infrastructure steering committee comprised of representatives from city infrastructure agencies and private utilities to guide the improvement of utility data so it can quickly be accessed and used during routine operations and emergencies. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And uh, okay, we we're gonna we're gonna ask questions after we have all the panelists uh, on this group. Okay. Um, Irene, call the next, uh, okay, go ahead. Um, I apologize, I was on mute. Uh, thank you again, Ms. Dwar, for your testimony. Now we will be calling on Mr. Leitner to testify. Time starts now. Okay, um, my deepest thanks to the council for considering this legislation. Uh, I'd like to recognize the efforts of IT Chairman Holden and council member Stephen Levin. By the way, I asked Steve about uh, digital twins. He's an expert on it. And Ben Callos. Borough President Gail Brewer has also been a GIS advocate and supporter for the past 30 years. She's been invaluable to us. I'd also like to extend special thanks to Elizabeth Adams, Chief of Staff to council member Levin. Um, a bit about my background. I worked for New York City government for 35 years and led the development of the city's GIS base map with Wendy Dorf. In subsequent years, I served as the city's geospatial information officer or GIO and directed the emergency mapping and data center following 9-11. I continued to work as a GIS consultant with NYU and with the Open Geospatial Consortium. Um, I'd like to just make a little remark about some of the testimony that's gone on so far. Love the idea of next-gen GIS. Uh, uh, Commissioner Tisch, congratulations. We love it and we'll help in every way we possibly can. But I would say that in terms of contemplating who will lead the GIS effort, 
as an assistant commissioner at Do It and GIO of the city for five years, I can tell you, it's very difficult to get things done when you're trying to deal with 50 other city agencies from a position of being an assistant commissioner. The deputy commissioner position puts you in position to actually talk toe to toe with your counterparts and other agencies. Um, and uh, I would also uh, mention that, um, that, that the problem with city GIS right now is not that the layers can't be overlaid because we have the geo support system that city planning did and because we have the base map that Department of Environmental Protection uh, financed and do it manages so that all the city agencies have these tools, they create their data so that they fit on a common base map with common location data. The real problem has been that we can't get people from the different agencies to talk to each other or to coordinate their activities. And that's why we were pushing so hard for a GIO and for a steering committee for GIS that meets multiple times a year. You cannot do without that kind of collaboration across city agencies into the private sector and utilities, you know, without having that kind of structure and that kind of authority. So to go on from there, geospatial uh, information systems are based on the use of location information, such as street name and address, latitude and longitude and elevation. Most people are familiar with GIS through maps that they use over the internet. Many think that GIS is just a pretty picture. They do not recognize that GIS is a combination of IT and the sciences of geography and geology. They fail to understand that behind every map, there are layers upon layers of data applications, algorithms, and analysis. So it's just not a pretty picture only. But GIS is even more than that. If all city agencies use the same standardized location data, which New York City now does, if they place their facilities and operating information on the same base map, then all the data, regardless of its source, regardless of who owns it or who stores it, all that data can be integrated with the right telecommunications. You can, that's known as federated data. You can bring it together in a snap. So when you were talking, when Helen Rosenthal, my council person, was talking about bringing together all complaint information and violations information, that can be done now because all that data is collected with um, a geo support system and on the base map so that it is all compatible. You just have to link the agencies. You have to get the agencies to talk to each other. And that's where we failed because we haven't had leadership, frankly, over the last number of years. Um, it's the GIS superpower to break down those data silos. And it was never more in evidence than as Wendy mentioned during 9-11, when we integrated hundreds and hundreds of layers of data from 50 different agencies, federal, state, local utilities, all on the base map, all using the geo support system. So it's been done, it was done you know, for 9-11 and it's been done since then. We just have to perfect it uh, with a more advanced system and with collaboration and leadership. I'd like to point out a, maybe a couple of more instances where GIS has been virtually. Oh, God. Well, let me keep going at least through these examples, which is West Nile virus. Using the city's base map, building layer, and catch basin infrastructure, a team of Hunter College and Department of Health experts developed a map that predicted where West Nile was likely to infect humans based on dead bird locations and mosquito traps and showed the city where to take action. This led to a sharp reduction in cases and in deaths. COVID may be a failure. The city was not prepared to rapidly capture location information for those testing positive for COVID and subsequent interactions with the health system. The city has the capability of mapping to the address points while keeping personal health information secure. As a result, the city's efforts were not as effective as they could have been. Sandy, New York City OEM using GIS had established evacuation zones along the coast in case of a major storm surge. While this certainly safeguarded people, major institutions did not pay attention. While Sandy's 10-foot surge was known about two days in advance, 
The Con Ed substation at East 14th Street was knocked out and the five level basement of NYU Medical Center was flooded, causing more than $1 billion in damages. Urban street flooding, our most recent case. Using GIS, city agencies had developed, it exists today, it's online, a street flooding map that showed low lying areas across the city using street building elevation and sewer layers. Using hydraulic modeling, they identified areas where flooding was expected um, and uh, should there be a downpour that exceeded 3.5 inches per hour. They had anticipated this. The problem was that the information had not been operationalized, put into alerts, um, notifications, and actions by city first responders. Therefore, 11 people drowned in basement apartments who were completely unaware of the danger other than receiving generic warnings about flooding. Um, I suppose I can add there, I have the rest written. I would end with this statement. If we follow through with Commissioner Tisch's uh, plan to uh, advance GIS in the city, we have an inside track on being able to use breakthrough technologies like digital twins, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data analytics, the internet of things, the evolution of sensor technologies, underground infrastructure data integration, and advanced uses of mobile devices. And that's just a few. GIS is pertinent in every one of them and the data generated because it's in a New York City GIS can be integrated. So let's push this as hard as we can, as smart as we can for the benefit of the people who live in this city. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Alan. I'm gonna have some questions, but let's go on to the next panelist. Thank you, Mr. Leitner for your testimony. Now we will be calling on Professor Ahern to testify. Time starts now. Well, good afternoon, Chair Holden and Borough President Brewer. Um, this is a really exciting uh, development and meeting and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I uh, am a professor at Hunter College, director of the Center for Advanced Research of Spatial Information. And I was actually on New York City GIS steering committee in 1995, and as was Al and Wendy. And we sat around with 15 or 20 other agencies and we talked about creating the first base map for New York City. And that contract came out of DEP and my lab actually implemented it. And we hired a photogrammetric firm and we did the quality assurance and project management. And we managed, our lab managed the update and maintenance of the city for 2001, 2004, before we turned it over to do it. Um, I also worked on the management of the conversion of the sewer maps, 150,000 as-built diagrams into a seamless logical uh, sewer map, which Al alluded to, where we can now know what the capacity of every catch basin is, so we can predict where it's going to flood in the city. All of these components add together to a whole. You know, we've talked about data and data layers. Well, modeling is the next step. And that's precisely what Al referred to when he said a model was created to look at where the city was vulnerable. And when we talk about technologies, there's about 5 billion square feet in New York City. We have the elevation of every square foot in, in New York City using a technology called LIDAR. Now, when we got together in 1995, we had all the agencies and we had them all sort of dial in. What do you need? What can we produce that will meet your needs? What's happening now in New York City, and I'll just use this because it's the simplest, clearest win, is you've got separate agencies ordering citywide data sets like LIDAR without any spec and without any discussion with anybody else in the city as to how those data sets can be used. That's a huge waste. They're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, sometimes more, and they actually don't know how other agencies could take advantage of those data sets. So if we had that steering committee, which is proposed by 2158, we should clear all New York City acquisitions of data through that committee. 
so that everybody weighs in and says, you know what, if you could increase the resolution, I can get a better handle on flooding in that area. And there's all kinds of examples like that. So that's a very easy one. Um, so I'm obviously very much in favor of this. And in terms of the five deputies that somebody brought up, we don't want a cowboy with all hat and no cattle. You do need five deputies. This is a complex system and it's difficult to manage. So I'm totally in favor of that. Um, there was a discussion about, well, do it's gonna be centralized, but these agencies have the data. Well, yes, that's the model. Agencies are the stewards of their own data. Do it centralizes that data and takes the most recent copy and integrates all of those agency data layers. And they are used for all kinds of modeling. And separately, yeah, those agencies can do some modeling, but when you bring them together, it becomes very powerful. And then we can begin to deploy some of the new technologies like artificial intelligence, although beware of that, be careful there, <laughs> um, to create smart city technologies where we can, you know, we can predict, we can manage. We now have real-time capabilities. We have sensor networks. So it's really a new dawn in terms of the type of data that we have access to and the technologies and the way in which we can integrate it to create models to help manage our city better. And um, I think that's all I'll say today. I appreciate the time and I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, go ahead, I'm sorry. Thank you, Professor, for your testimony. Now we'll be calling on Mr. Zhang Ken He to testify. Time starts now. Hello, I'm I'm, Z. I'm glad to be here with my former professors and top GIS experts. Uh, as I got my undergrad at, um, my undergraduate at uh, Hunter College, and I'd like to thank you and uh, BP Brew and council members for allowing me to testify today and also introducing this law. Um, so today I'm speaking on um, behalf of Beta NYC as their assistant director of uh, the lab. Um, we're a nonprofit organization working to improve the lives of New Yorkers um, through uh, civic tech design and data. Um, at Beta NYC, we have a fellowship program and host events to train our students, the community boards, and the general public to use open data. And as new data sets get released, the, um, the amount of spatial data has also increased. And linking records by place has always been a top priority of, of community members to bring a light uh, inequality of existing issues, um, um, delivery of services, and maintenance of infrastructure. So we fully support this bill to create the position of the geospatial uh, information officer, since it's great importance um, of the government to know um, not only where um, what our assets are, but also where our assets and resources can be placed. Um, so I guess most of these, um, most of the points um, I've written in my testimony um, have been like said. So I just want to highlight some key points. So uh, I, I just want to make sure that um, um, when this database is created, it's well managed and updated. Um, if the data set, uh, if data sets do get stale or they're not accurate, they're not useful. And the officer must make sure that these um, data sets are updated and maintained by their respective agencies. And I, I think that this point has been already said, but strategy is important. Um, so so the, the officer must uh, see and put into action key data sets they deem um, important and also make this, these data sets um, useful um, and uh, usable by the community members. Um, so maybe in sets of tools and maps, as mentioned before. And then lastly, make sure that the information um, in this interagency portal that can be made public, um, made, um, made to be um, open data. So um, that's all I have to say, just to um, keep time, um, but thank you. Well, I, I must say, this is, uh, we just listened to four panelists with um, just such an impressive, uh, so impressive, uh, the information was like, I, I'd say I, I've been in the council almost four years. This is the, the most, uh, I think impressive panel that I've, I've, I've listened to, and it's exciting to hear. But on the same token, it's very frustrating why I hear this was people were on the steering committees in '95, and we're still not doing. We're not, we're not taking advantage of the technology, and we're still not learning lessons. So I, I, I put a question out for the four panelists. Whoever wants to take it first, but. Um, 
pulling all the agencies together is, is a daunting task. I think we heard that a number of times. Um, and, and, I, and I agree, maybe we do need uh, a number of uh, a deputy commissioner, a deputy commissioner and assistant commissioners, but we do need uh, possibly, because it is complicated, but it hasn't been done yet. And, it, it, and uh, you know, to pull all these agencies together. Uh, sometimes you have to wonder, are we capable of doing it um, with the current structure? And um, knowing your expertise, I, I hope you'll be involved in trying to put with the next administration, trying to pull it together. But um, what is that the biggest hurdle, just getting this, um, getting all the agencies on board? I guess I can answer that and, and uh, say that um, uh, it is a hurdle. It's not overwhelming. When I was the assistant commissioner and the GIO, all the GIS managers in all the city agencies wanted to come around a table and discuss. GIS is a very social technology. We all also know that we need the data from other agencies and we're always constantly looking for ways to collaborate and to work together. So that was a very natural thing. It was only when, how shall I say it, leadership started to step away from the idea of collaboration and leadership. That, that was an actual thing that happened over 10 years. I, I would say over the last 10 years uh, that everyone started to lose connections to each other and there was less collaboration and there was in fact, Gizmo, Shana, I want to talk Giz, Gizmo basically <laughs> took over a role of citywide coordination on a number of, of major initiatives like the underground infrastructure, because as much as we went to City Hall to say, please work with us on this and, and you lead this, there was a, a decline. So this hearing this today, from Commissioner Tish is such a, a breath of fresh air. We can do it. We just need the authority to do it. I, I'd like to uh, make a few comments along those lines too. I oh, mean, sure. basically uh, we, th we all know each other. The entire community is very uh, collaborative. Uh, Alan and I and Sean and a number of other people have probably spent the last 20 or 30 years working, uh, trying to, to get exactly what we are all supporting today. I mean, it's really a big day. Alan and I went around, we interviewed every agency in New York City under the auspices of the mayor's office. The DDC called us in. We got all the data and information in terms of what the agencies actually have and hold, but we still couldn't get them to play ball together. And so, you know, we, we keep trying and we now we have an opportunity to work with NYU on a, uh, a pilot project in two areas of New York City, just announced this week. One of them is Sunset Park and one of them is East Midtown, two very different communities. And what we're hoping is, you know, we can pile in all the information as we, as we study these two areas uh, underground. Uh, uh, and try to use the opportunity to introduce new technologies, sensor technologies and everything else that we, we can bring to bear. We have a year to do it, but we have the team and we actually interviewed almost everybody in New York City. Only one agency, which I'm not gonna mention, didn't come to the table, but all the utilities were there, community leaders, everyone agreed to play in our backyard for this project. And we're very excited. It's going to start November 15th. And basically, I mean, this is a city project. We, this is the opportunity to use this project to, to demonstrate how it can be done. Of course, I just want to mention one more thing that with infrastructure, security is a major issue. And um, uh, we've also worked uh, on some of the variable ways of storing data. And most likely, at least with the substructure, the, the only way that we'll probably get buy-in and for good reason in an age of terror is to uh, have sort of a federated, everybody will be together in terms of using the same longitude, latitude, base map and everything else when needed in an emergency 
and everything will be standardized, but the, the underground data cannot be hosted, I don't think, in one place. As long as we're all in the game together and using the same standards, it can be called in for whatever is needed. And that's my two cents worth. I thank you very much. I thank you, Commissioner. I hope we have an opportunity to meet. This is a very special day for the GIS community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. I, I see we have Council Member Malone with a question for the panel. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Holden. I, I have never seen a panel with the experience and the guidance. So thank you so much. It seems like you went back to my dad and Speaker Peter Malone with, with trying to get this yeah. done. It seems like this <laughs> yeah. has been going on for a little bit. Bob and I just trying to get yeah. caught up. In here. <laughs> here. Which he would have enjoyed. He would have enjoyed listening to your testimony. Although it would have been hard to get him to commit to anything technological. I'm still trying to help him <laughs> with emails and printing. But, you know, one of the tools in our box, because so much of this is wishing and hoping, and we're so close and we're excited, but yet we're still not. So I remember one of the first things I did uh, when I was on the aging committee, and I tried to give guidance in the world of guardianship, and a lot of the committee, a lot of the city agencies didn't know about it. So I called a, a special committee, a task force of the agencies and the folks, just like yourself, and they came around the table, and we re revamped. Article 81 and guardianship boards. That seems like something similar to me here, especially with the pilot programs that you already have up and running to get the agencies and get the commissioner and get a chair Holden and the council members that will be post January um, a chance to do this, to keep that momentum going. It might be something chair Holden can do. And, and it's kind of like would be in the background. So whether the commissioner or if it gets done, fine, we can put the task force and the committee to the side. But if, if it seems to be lagging, because we've been hearing the same testimony for years and you've been working on this for decades, it might be the spark that keeps the ball rolling. So I just throw that out there. So um, it's something like one of those other tools that we could use because we can't lose your, your information and guidance and everything that you have been doing. So I just wanted to thank each one of you, Sean, Wendy, Alan, and all, all the folks that have testified. For, all right. for thank you. Things. You know, Thank maybe you. I could remark here, uh, is I know we can do this because you just have to look at 911 and, and uh, real-time crime and uh, other NYPD and FDNY and OEM systems. They all depend on GIS. They all have been built and they're all effective. 911, how many lives does 911 save on a daily basis? Yet, if you don't have accurate mapping of where a complaint or distress call comes from, you, you know, you don't want to dispatch to a zip code. You want to dispatch to a building footprint, to an address point. We can do that. We are doing that. 911 does that magnificently. We well, how much, and how much did we learn after 9-11? how we needed to exchange, upgrade our communications on that. And so, so much we learned from one major event that we upgraded immediately so that the communication system between NYPD, FDNY, EMS wasn't all just on one channel. Um, so we're still growing. Yeah. Yes. Getting better. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Council member 11, you have your hand up. Do you have a question for this panel? Um, starts now. Uh... Yes, I do. Yes, I do, Chair. Sorry, my my two-year-old is screaming in the background here, but I just want to thank, um, uh, again, especially Wendy and Al and Sean, um, but in particular, Wendy and Al, who I was just going back to my old emails. I've been working with them on this stuff since 2013. So I just want to thank you um, uh, both for, um, uh, for your, you know, uh, really remarkable dedication. Um, to uh, you, you uh, have helping. It as well. You have it as help. well, and you, you help keep us moving forward. Thank you very much. You and Elizabeth, really. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you. I just want to, one other question of the panel, because if any city agency should use this, uh, uh, if anyone, the GIS is DDC. Now, you mentioned DDC before. Um, I've had some nightmare stories about how sewer projects were they, they, they were doing um, boring samples and didn't do it in the right spot and then discovered um, 
a mess or pollution or you name it, and the project was stopped and millions of dollars had to be allocated additional, they had to close up the street. So these sewer projects were put on hold with the people with millions of dollars wasted and people, you know, inconvenienced to no end for years. Uh, I'm, I'm talking several years where the street was opened up and so forth and so on. So can you, can somebody speak to that? Why, you know, it, is DDC using it? Side for Okay, let, let me no, start. DDC, DDC, no, but DDC <laughs> basically collects a lot of the data from the infrastructure agencies and does the budgeting and everything else. We interviewed many people there. There are things I'm not gonna say in this forum, but basically what we found was the rank and file, once they realized that we weren't just consultants there to tell them what to do, gave us an enormous amount of information. They're very dedicated. They knew what all the problems were about data sharing. I mean, we have information that I joke around and say, we could write a book better than Robert Moses did. But we won't because we want to. We don't want. We want to continue this, and we don't want to, you know, uh, create any conflicts with any of the agencies. But DDC, uh, they have the capacity. Um, I don't know. You know, I don't. I don't know where the problems are. I think they're actually between the infrastructure agencies, and they land at DDC. Well, I'll just, Wendy. Uh, you're very kind, but um, I, when you experience people that are about to dig up your streets and don't know the history of that area you know that it, let's say the one i'm talking about in middle village was a garbage dump and they didn't know that the ddc didn't even do that i knew that because i know the history of my community and then they discovered pollution in there they discovered lead which i could have told them they probably would have discovered that and it stopped the project but th this is the information that they could access very easily. Um, and they didn't. And it cost millions and such an inconvenience to so many homeowners. So I don't have that much patience <laughs> to pull punches, but this, you know, GIS is so important that we get it moving and uh, I'll be the next council. So um, I'm gonna move it forward, whether I'm on technology or not, but I will certainly I think this is so important a topic. Nothing is more important, I think, you know, that, that we can do right now is to get this moving and to get, you know, obviously we heard the commissioner say, it, but it's so, so important that we not only, you know, have the information, but that we use it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's what I, that's what I'm most concerned that we're not- um, even... Talk about the history. Let, talk let, about the history. Let me just say, so we worked with DDC for about a year. We had those interviews that Wendy mentioned. And also we have the trans, not the transcripts, but the no detailed notes from those meetings, which are available, you know, and we wouldn't mind sharing them. Uh, we know that there was a GI, a small GIS unit at DDC that was building layers of information for just the reason that you discussed. But we were also aware that about the time we were discontinued from DDC, that unit seemed to be disbanded and we haven't heard about it and since. When was, when was that, Alan? This was about two I years ago. COVID. Yeah. It was the so October of two years ago. Okay. We were summarily dismissed after doing those interviews and turning them over and with a whole game plan. And then the GIS unit was, I guess it was sort of broken up. And so therefore, there was a general. Oh, there was a gentleman there who was the, sort of the expert on history. That's what I thought you were going to talk about. Oh, oh, oh yeah, the ground, and he was like put in the corner, and he, he knows, has information. You have, to, you have to know the history of the site before you do anything. Absolutely. Yes. And I, nobody. I mean, you could have Googled it even and got the information of the site. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's mind boggling. It, I just was. It is. <laughs> You're absolutely I have correct. a DVD. Oh, I didn't know it was, it was only two. It was we were very recent that was disbanded. We need to check on that. I have a DVD with about 50 layers of historical information about what's under the street from this guy who was shoved into a corner at DDC. Right. And, right. and they lost interest in that. Well, again, we will meet. And this, this, this is, uh, we have to meet regularly, but this, this is the thing we have to follow through. Thank you all. We have to move on to the next panel, but 
I, we can go on forever. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. So much. Uh, again, unbelievable panel uh, that we just uh, heard from, and this this um, we have to revisit quickly. And, and uh, you know, again, we could have used it in the storm, but let let's make sure we do this this time, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I would like now to welcome our next panel, and we will be hearing testimonies from Kathleen Collins and Terence Page. Ms. Collins? Time starts now. Good uh, afternoon. I am, uh, my name is Kathleen Collins, and I'm a white woman wearing uh, greenish blue headphones. I have brown short hair, and I'm wearing a sleeveless uh, aqua shirt. And I am a congenital quadruple amputee and a native New Yorker. I would just like to, first of all, what I just did was we call an audio description of myself. And uh, that's to help people who are either low vision or blind or who are listening in on a Zoom meeting so they know who is speaking and they can get a picture of the person in their mind. Um, Today, I would just like to remind the New York City Council's Committee on Technology that any technology you implement needs to be accessible to all New Yorkers, including New Yorkers with disabilities. Access means that any app or website must be screen readable, provide closed captioning, which I noticed this Zoom meeting does not provide, and I believe it is for free with the, uh, if you have a Zoom paid account, which I believe the city probably has a paid account, so you just have to enable that, and you should be enabling that at every city council meeting where you are providing access through Zoom. Um, so as I digress there, um, let's get back to this. Okay, provide screen be screen readable, provide closed captioning, and allow New Yorkers to enlarge the print. Further, any app or website should be simple to navigate, to use, and should provide voice commands as an option also for people with manual dexterity disabilities. Finally, the needs of New Yorkers that do not have access to the internet must not be forgotten. Any services and information provided through the inter internet also must be available to New Yorkers who do not have access to the internet in a vi variety of accessible formats, such as large print, braille, and through the use of audio so that people who may not be able to see or be able to read braille can also uh, hear the information and services that can be provided. Um, also, I noticed that a couple of things that were said here during this meeting. One was about that uh, one of the last speakers, uh, if I mispronounce your name, I'm sorry, Mr. Zeng, uh, Mr. He, but uh, he pointed out that data sets must be usable and we need them to be usable by all the population. Also, uh, the person, I'm sorry, Chair Holden, you pointed out the need for real-time information for safety of uh, New Yorkers, and that real-time information needs to be accessible to people with disabilities so they too are protected from harm. Um, one other thing, I noticed that uh, they were talking about how the information that they want to provide, I believe it was the commissioner, that stated about that they were going to provide the information on data to uh, the uh, borough presidents and to the uh, community boards, but how, and also to the city council, but also how about reaching out to disability organizations and advocacy groups that represent uh, people with disabilities, such as my, I belong to a couple of different groups. I belong, I'm a member of the Greater New York Council of the Blind um, on the board of Disabled in Action and I am a co-coordinator of Downstate New York ADAPT. And I too am an attorney. I worked for the Port Authority for 30 years in litigation. So I know about uh, a lot of things. You can tap my brain and I'd be happy to help out. And also I have uh, an accounting background so I understand money and how it works. So um, and we in the disabled community, you know, we, we have people that are very tech savvy, we have people that do uh, programming. We have many different, we, we have many backgrounds. So please reach out to us. We are out there 
and we don't need to you know reinvent the wheel the wheel is there you just have to come to us to get the wheel so please do and thank you for your time thank you kathy we're going to bring some of your suggestions back to the city council you made some very very good points i thank you for that thank and you and just one other thing uh just to take down our email address it's uh dny adapt at gmail.com okay. please reach out to us great we monitor that email all the time so thank you thank you so thank much. you Thank you so much for your testimony. The next panelist is Terrence Page. Time starts now. Terrence Page. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, my name is Terrence Page. I am also, I am the president of the Greater New York Council of the Blind. And I am also a member of Downstate New York, my partner, and I work with Kathy Collins. And I'd like to echo everything she just said. I don't want to take up much time, but I want you to know that when you are reaching out to various communities and the note she made a point of, that you should also make sure that when you're using screen reader technology, that it be accessible to everyone. When you develop this program, make sure that when your blind and visual impaired workers have the ability to use this software, so they are not locked, locked out, the, I'm sorry, locked out of the process and unable to do their jobs. That's what I wanna say, thank you, and have a wonderful day. Again, Terrence Page, you can reach here, us at our website, Greater New York Council of the Blind, and thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Thank you. Terrence and, and Kathleen. We're, we will have we'll set up a meeting um, to to go over. I mean, this is a very very important issue, and uh, like you said, the council should be the leaders on this. And um, so we need your we we certainly need your uh, your testimony um, and input. So thank you so much, both uh, Terrence and Kathleen, for this. I think we should go to our next panelists and our next panelist will be Daniel Schwartz, Kathleen McGee, Clayton Banks, and Jose Chapa. Mr. Schwartz. Time starts now. My name is Daniel Schwartz and I'm testifying on behalf of the New York Civil Liberties Union. We thank the committee and the council members for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to provide testimony today. We have significant concerns about the digital identification program as laid out in intro 2305 and oppose the legislation in its current form. While a carefully implemented and nuanced digital ID system may prove worthwhile and beneficial, if done improperly, it could have far reaching ramifications, entrench injustice, erode privacy rights and threaten our civil rights and liberties. Intro 2305 risks the latter by creating a pathway for new tracking capabilities without setting the necessary guardrails and oversight. As currently drafted, a mayor designated city agency would work in partnership with a financial institution on a digital ID feasibility study and report. Mandating a FinTech vendor to be the sole partner is problematic at best. To succeed, the focus must be squarely on equity and privacy, not a company's bottom line. Appropriate partners would be experts in cryptography, cybersecurity, open source tech, immigrants' rights, civil rights, and accessibility, as just also highlighted from Kathleen Collins and Terence Page. And most importantly, representatives from the communities most affected by such a program, especially those receiving public assistance. Further, any digital identification program must be entirely voluntary, require opt-in consent, offer granular control over one's data, and ensure strong privacy protections, guaranteed both by legal and technical safeguards. But the technology is not ready yet. Open standards development is still in process, and the city should not fall for proprietary tech developed behind closed doors, forcing costly vendor lock-ins as experienced in the past. Transparent and auditable open standards are the only meaningful path to ensure trust and security. Unfortunately, throughout the pandemic, opaque, exploitative and discriminatory technologies were deployed for digital ID verification. 21 states have procured a facial recognition tool for unemployment insurance processing. 
The New York Department of Labor is one of them, thereby creating new barriers for people to receive their benefits by requiring the provision of their biometric data to third party vendors and risking misidentification through a technology that has repeatedly been shown to have significantly higher error rates for women and people of color. It is incumbent on the council to not repeat these mistakes and ensure such technologies have no place in our city. We urge the committee to not rush the digital ID infrastructure prematurely. If done wrong, it would enable new modes of surveillance and lock people out from much needed city services. Any steps towards a digital ID system must center equity and privacy protections from the very beginning. And for this, it matters who sits at the table and what values undergird the endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Schwartz, for your testimony. Now I will be calling Ms. McGee to testify. Time starts now. Good afternoon, council members, Chair Holden. My name is Carrie McGee, and I'm a legal fellow at the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. Thank you for allowing me to testify today about Introduction 2305. To put it simply, digital identification solves a problem we don't have. New Yorkers already have to carry photo ID in too many places throughout this city. Rather than expanding the types of ID we have and the number of places we must use it, the council should be rolling back the need for photo ID in public life. Already we have driver's licenses, NYC ID, work IDs, student IDs, and many more. Making ID digital will only increase demand for it until we are ID'd every time we buy groceries, book a theater ticket, or enter a store. These demands will inevitably fall on BIPOC and undocumented New Yorkers, their ID data tracked by police, and even ICE. Whether online or locally secured, New Yorkers simply do not need this kind of digital ID. Thus, we urge the Committee on Technology to not pass this introduction. The draft legislation fails to explain what type of ID it's seeking to investigate. We read the bill as contemplating two discrete use cases, each of which is concerning for the reasons stated below. In the first case, the city might generate a locally stored digital credential, similar to what is used for many sports and cultural events. Such an ID could be presenting on, presented on a phone or smart device or in, for in-person verification. Alternatively, the legislation could contemplate a remotely verifiable credential that can be used remotely via an, via an internet enabled portal. These products pose drastically different public policy and civil rights consequences. Creating in-person digital identification will pose significant privacy problems. Iowa's transportation director has already excitedly proclaimed how a digital license could be bound to hunting and fishing licenses, weapons permits, and tax returns. The consolidation of this volume of information to something as immediately personal and as frequently used as a driver's license should scare you. The examples given are just the beginning. Your license could eventually be tied to recent purchases, to outcomes of parole mandated drug testing, to your recent attendance at a ball game or on a subway train or anywhere. The points of personal information that could be tied to this kind of identification are limitless and the consequences could be devastating. Furthermore, by unlocking one's phone to display a digital ID, New Yorkers would put themselves at risk. Think of a typical traffic stop where you are asked to provide your license. What if you had a digital license, but you had to unlock your phone to access it? Inherently, the system would demand that you unlock your phone and hand it to the police officer. Think of everything in your phone, your texts, your photos, your contacts. Digital ID creates a real risk of exposing New Yorkers to warrantless searches every time an officer asks to see ID. Forgetting your turn signal should not give officers access to your most intimate files. If digital ID is used remotely, it would quickly become yet another online tracking tool. The easier we make it for websites to ask for ID, the more they'll do it. This provides unprecedented ability to connect our digital and real world identities. That should terrify you. The ability to be anonymous online would evaporate. It's easy to write this off as something not necessary for regular people, but it absolutely is. LGBTQ teenagers looking for resources and information, adults who Google medical symptoms in search of whether they need a doctor, and individuals who are already working one job and looking for another, those searches could all become tied to your identity, your name, address, income, everything. Digital identification is a slippery slope to never being anonymous in any space ever again. This bill fails to acknowledge the danger that the system it wants to create would pose. New York City's surveillance always falls hardest on BIPOC New Yorkers. Digital IDs will be no exception. BIPOC New Yorkers systematically are systematically surveilled from NYPD surveillance of mosques to being targeted in stop and frisk to the audio surveillance that is ShotSpotter. 
Expanding digital identification will, no matter your intent, evolve into dossiers that New Yorkers are forced to compile on themselves. Have you ever left your phone on the seat of a bus on the table at your favorite restaurant? Have you ever attempted to start an app on your phone, one that was just working and suddenly it won't stop crashing? Technology fails sometimes. And as your phone becomes more closely tied to your identity, losing it or breaking it will be a disaster. These systems undergirding the physical phones are also not invulnerable to hacking or to simple mistake. And for those foregoing reasons, I urge the city council not to pass introduction 2305 or create this new tracking tool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. McGee. We will be hearing next from Clayton Banks. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, great to see Chair Holden and Irene and everyone else. Uh, I've been inspired, particularly listening on the entire call so far, um, particularly around the conversation on GIS. And I just wanted to add a couple of quick things. So during this hearing and what I've heard you know, prior to the hearing is a lot about the use of data um, and what I'm finding out, it's, it's the use of data from the variety of city agencies that are um, integrated, if you will, into the, and, and, and talking a lot about the next-gen GIS platform. But the thing, uh, Chair, is are we getting the voice of the New Yorkers? I know I'm very pleased to have my voice at this table, but I think it needs to go further than that. It needs to be a participatory strategy when we are looking at next-gen GIS platforms. One of the reasons that we think about is when you look at it, a community, particularly like Harlem and some of the uptown spaces, Queens, et cetera, South Bronx, um, you're looking at, if you don't have the voice of the people, there's a good, a good chance that you can get bad data or bad um, outcomes. A good example, right, predictive mapping. Well, crime stats are often biased. So you actually hurt a, a community. So I'm just saying that it's important to have, if you will, bottom-up community input in mapping and data that will determine these service levels. So participatory mapping is what I'm sharing today. It will allow for communities to ask, for, for example, how about more streets trees here? or street lights, or flood protections, or even charging stations for the oncoming uh, future of autom automobiles. So all of this can be impacted by our communities and having a participatory methodology as we look at this next-gen GIS. Thank you, and I uh, hope to, uh, to be a part of the process as we go. Thank you very much, Mr. Banks. And our next panelist will, will be Jose Chapa. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having this hearing. My name is Jose Chapa. I'm the Senior Policy Associate for the Immigrant Defense Project. Um, thank you, Committee Chair Holden, and to the members of the committee for holding this hearing. The Immigrant Defense Project is a New York-based nonprofit that works to secure fairness and justice for all immigrants by focusing on the rights of those caught at the intersection of the criminal justice system and the immigration system. IDP is concerned about the proposal to address the feasibility for a digital ID program that could be used to determine eligibility for public benefits and access to city services, as well as to provide financial services through a fintech company. A couple of years ago, IDP, as a part of the NYC Municipal ID Coalition, raised a host of concerns, including privacy, surveillance, and financial equity, about the proposal to add a digital ID functionality to the ID NYIC. Our coalition worked in 2014 with the New York City Council and the administration for a municipal ID that would ensure equal access to services and protections for all New Yorkers. We continue to believe in the central principle of the coalition, which was to protect the privacy and security of cardholders and to provide a uniquely protected state-issued ID card for those who were vulnerable as they often faced obstacles in acquiring one namely the homeless, formerly incarcerated people, gender non-conforming people, youth, and undocumented immigrants. 
Two years ago, IDP spoke out against the de Blasio administration's uh, soliciting proposal from financial firms to integrate multiple functions into DID and YIC, which according to the solicitation, the chip would allow cardholders to load funds onto their ID and YIC cards, make payments to private vendors, and enable integrations with public and private partners, such as the MTA's planned contactless fair payment system and the NYIC health hospital medical records. Digital ID programs have been shown to raise significant issues around privacy and control over collected data. These well-documented issues include compulsory enrollment data and privacy breaches, increasing police power, and the elevation of corporate-based solutions over community solutions. In the case of the previous ID NYAC proposal, our coalition pointed out in a letter submitted originally to the mayor on September 12, 2019 and attached uh, to the document I'm going to submit, even if well intended, connect, even if well intended, connecting this kind of technology and data to vulnerable New Yorkers, identification cards would expose people to serious risks, including dangerous experimentation or misuse by current or future administrations and private vendors that far outweigh any potential benefits. IDNYAC financial technology fintech partnership would eliminate banking deserts. This is false. Fintech companies are not banks. They do not provide branches or, and personnel that customers can uh, readily access. They do not have legal obligations to reinvest in communities, and they are not subject to the strong, ununiform federal regulations and consumer protections that govern banks and credit unions. We continue to be concerned about the infiltration of privacy and control over data that, would, that the city might collect. We are also concerned that the legislation states that the city agency would work in consultation with at least one financial institution. One of our primary concerns with the proposal to include a smart chip on the IDNYC was that there was no meaningful opportunities for community or and stakeholder engagement around issues related to privacy, data security, or financial equity. Speaking from the position of an organization whose goal is to provide maximum protection for immigrants during a time of increasing hostility and the constantly growing engagement of the tech industry in the surveillance policing state, it is clear that the correct path is not to give financial corporations more power and information on us than they already have. If this legislation moves forward, we encourage the city council to include community organizations that have been focused on financial equity, surveillance, and privacy rights. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Chair Holden, do you have any questions to the panel? Well, I just want to, I'll state something, which is, um, you know, I, we do care about privacy and this is a, a purely voluntary uh, program. So, you know, it's still, the bill has to, you know, we're still going to um, take input and I, I do take that seriously. Right now, the poorest New Yorkers are forced to give up uh, their info, uh, birth certificate, social security number, proof of employment, just to get their benefits. So th this kind of, and the way we envision it now, and obviously it could change, but this is a voluntary program. You, you decide what information you can give or you should have on your digital ID. And that, that would lead, you know, obviously to actually protecting it from it, protecting the information you don't want out there. So, th but this could, we could work this out and this, this could evolve but we're trying to make it easier. But right now, the poorest New Yorkers have to give up everything, all their information, just to get basic benefits. So, um, uh, we'll learn, you know, we're going to learn more. We want to have input, and, uh, and I'm listening. And it's a very good panelist, and um, I think there's some very, very good suggestions here. Um, and we're, you know, the bill with the feasibility study. We're just studying the feasibility, obviously, of of this and. You know, it, it's just uh, exploring information. And Clayton, by the way, I just want, I want to mention that's a very, very important uh, topic that you just mentioned about community input. I was about that. I was a member of the of community board for 30 years, uh, also a civic association. We definitely wanted input, and uh, so that's more. That's very, very important aspect. And I thank you for that. Um, so I want to thank the, the entire panel, uh, the last two panels actually. Uh, for that input. It's nice to hear some concerns. And uh, I know committee council is very uh, involved in the privacy aspect. So she's going to keep us on the straight now. And I, I, I want to, I just want to assure all the panelists that talked about privacy, that uh, the committee council for technology, that's one of the, her main 
obviously topics. So I just want to, and, and I, I don't know if you want to speak to that, uh, Irene, but we, we, you know, you, you keep us on that, uh, you know, that topic all the time. So I just want to say that, but thank you panelists. Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you, everyone, for your testimony. It's very important to us. And if we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, please use the raise, Zoom raise hand function. And I do not see any hands right now. And I will turn it over to Chair Holden for any closing remarks and to adjourn the hearing. So I just want to thank everyone uh, who gave uh, testimony. I think this is one of our best hearings that we've had. I think uh, everyone will agree uh, that moving technology forward in New York City uh, can benefit us, make our quality of life much better and save lives. And we heard uh, expert testimony today. I think every panelist that, that spoke had a lot to offer and I thank them for that. I thank everyone. I thank the Committee on Technology and certainly Irene Bohosky and uh, so many, and Charles Kim and everyone um, that, that made this uh, hearing possible. And certainly, thank you, sergeants. Thank you for all uh, the work you guys do. Have an excellent, excellent restful weekend. You guys earned it this, this week. Uh, it's been a very busy week for everyone and it should be a nice weekend. Thanks so much. Thank you.